Hey guys, Dr. Dex here. Today I want to do a Q&A with you. We have so many questions and I have so many answers for you. So don't forget to click the subscribe button. Only 17% of you subscribe to our channel. So I'll tell you what, if you stay to the end of the video, I have a giveaway I'm going to do. So make sure you watch this video in full and you got to hit that subscribe button. Okay, let's get on with it. Tell me more about your screw footings. All right, so we use a company called MassCore Helical Piles. The owner of that company's name is Max. Max is a really cool guy. He's been so supportive. He sold me the driver for the helicals, completely explained everything. I got into helical piles because I was having problems with how much concrete we're having to pour because where I live, the state mandated a higher pound per square foot load capacity to build our decks to. When that happened, I used to be able to, to, to dig either like a 16 inch square footing, like two feet deep. We don't have frost issues like a lot of the other people do in the country and North and Canada and that kind of thing. So our frost depth isn't super deep, but when they increased the load capacity, that meant I had to go to a 30 inch by 30 inch by 24 inch deep with rebar. And it really started costing a lot of money because I used to hand mix and pour all of our concrete footings. So I was looking into ulterior options and screw piles seemed to be the right fit or helical piles. So basically I had a machine, I invested in the driver, I invested in the piles. Max sent me my first order. The machine ended up being a little underpowered and too small. I was actually flipping the machine over uh, when I was trying to drive in some hard ground. So I upgraded my machine, which was a hefty investment. That was a $35,000 investment for a, a nice used machine, but it allows me not only to have a really awesome machine, you can see some other videos on our channel about the Ditch Witch, the SK800, uh, it just works really great. And I just, I absolutely love that machine. My only regret is that I, I didn't buy a bigger one, but a bigger one would have cost twice as much. So I just figured, well, this is good for a used machine. It only had 700 hours on it. I was happy with it. And it drives our piles just fine. So to make a long story short, we use the Mascore Helical brand and we use the driver they recommend. And I'm very happy with that. And I have a great relationship with Max and they've been working out splendid. So there you go. Why don't you use vertical bracing on your post for elevated decks? I think what you're asking about, I call them corbels or the Y bracing like this, knee bracing, some people call it. For one, they're ugly. I don't like the way they look. And two, they don't really eliminate the racking or the wobble completely. Now V bracing, or Z, W bracing underneath a deck, that eliminates wobble. So when I install that, the deck will not shake back and forth. If I just do knee braces, I'm still getting this, at least during framing. Sometimes after installing all the decking, yeah, it probably eliminates it. But I've actually done that and the deck still wobbled, so then we still had to put the V bracing in. So why do it if, you, if it's not gonna eliminate the issue that it's designed for. Best uh, way slash blade to cut composite for the border to fall in place. I think this person's asking, how do I cut in my borders? I use a DeWalt track saw, the cordless flex volt version. I actually have a corded version before the flex volt came out. And then once the flex volt came out, I went ahead and got one of those as well because the cordless revolution is, is real. We use a ton of cordless tools. We still have a few corded tools and, and extension cords that we use for certain things, but the Track saw has been awesome. I have several length tracks. I have a nine footer, a five footer, a three footer, and a two footer. I actually bought a five footer and cut it down to a three and a two because sometimes you just need a short cut. And even though, yeah, I could probably eyeball that and make that cut, then you go back and go, crap, it's not straight. And then you got to sand it out. So if you just use a track saw to begin with, it just, it's a one less step or two less steps you got to take to make it look good or to make it right. So I like my track saw, I like my DeWalt stuff. Uh, I heard the Makita has a really great one. Of course there's Festool, which is like German dominant, you know, they're a great product as well. I've never used either of those though, so I can't really vouch for them. I've always had the DeWalt one and it's always met my purpose very well. So that's what I use. Have you found a laser that works well in bright conditions? So what I've found is as far as lasers and bright sunlight, you're really not gonna find a laser that works super great. Now in overcast sky, I found that Stabila has a green laser that shows up pretty well on a reflective measuring stick. 
if you have a measuring stick that has a little bit of reflectiveness to it, that can be seen fairly well uh, up to maybe 25 feet. So besides that, if you just use one of the receivers, I actually have a receiver that's dual, a dual laser receiver. So it picks up red and green. That is a really great product and uh, all by Stabila and those work wonderful. I just use a receiver pretty much all the time so I never off and it's, there's a visual and an audible that comes with that so that you can actually even mark your stick and then take your measurements and you're accurate all the time. So that's what I would suggest. Is there such a thing as too many lights on a deck? I think so. I think lighting should be an accent, softer, to direct a path or to indicate a measure of safety of somehow. So we use them a lot on steps. We use them on benches and sometimes indirectly on benches so they glow a little bit, which is kind of cool. And we're also gonna be getting into some flexible lighting that we're gonna be running in some of our uh, curved applications as well. So stay on the lookout for that. We'll see how those run out. They're gonna be by Inlight, by the way. How long do you recommend letting AZEC acclimate on site before installing? There's really no rule to that. You should be able to just get your boards on site, get them up on the frame and start installing them. I don't really let things acclimate. Now, if it's really hot, I won't cut a finish line unless it's cool. So that's the one thing I would suggest. Don't cut your AZEC decking when it's 100 degrees at three o'clock in the afternoon. Just wait till the next day let it cool off. Now, some people will be like, well, doctor, I can't wait. I got production, production, production. Well, if you're gonna do that, leave it long. Leave it an eighth inch longer than you need and minimize your gap. So when you come back the next day, you're not looking at it going, oh man, I got a three eighth inch gap now and I needed a quarter inch or a 16th or a half or whatever, or eighth, whatever. How do you fix a chip in AZEC? Okay, we, we just did a Q and A not too long ago. We we're talking about Sashko's exact color match caulk. That's how I would try to fix a chip, but usually we're either trying to cortex a chip, like if it's a notch or a chip and you can put a cortex plug in there, great. If not, sometimes you gotta just replace the board and eat it. And I just talked about this, but it says, if you can't make your money cut in the morning and have to cut in the heat, how much gap to use? I'd say I'd decrease at least a 16th, but this is a guessing game. Depending on how hot it really is and how cool it's gonna be, I might cut it an eighth long and be safe, then cut it maybe a 16th long and it'd be too short or maybe cut it dead. If you're gonna cut it dead on, I'd probably add an eighth of an inch at least. When was the last time you built a lumber plank deck? <laughs> I can't remember. It's been 15, 20, 15 years. I've done some Ipe, some hardwoods, but it's been a while. How do you keep even spacing between decking during cold mornings and warm afternoons? The gap of your decking isn't gonna change a whole lot depending on heat. It's mostly length. And we just were talking about this. So when it's warm, you gotta consider shrinkage of the board. Expansion and contraction. It's a it's legitimately is something important to think about. I've never had a problem laying decking on a hot day side by side and putting a 3 16 gap. You're not gonna get a um, three quarter inch gap by morning. It's it doesn't it doesn't move too much this way. It moves this way. What is the green brand of drills and impacts? Most of our green tools are made by a company called Metabo HPT. They make a value priced product that's high quality. I like their brand, I like most of what they sell, uh, but our favorite of their product is two things. I like their impact drivers, their triple hammer impact drivers, especially their new one that just came out is really impressive. Their seven and a quarter inch uh, rear handle saw is the lightest of all the saws available and it has a lot of good power for just one battery. And you can plug it in if you want to, uh, so that's kind of cool. So just something to think about as far as the battery price goes, they're more economically priced. I like the Metabo HPT. We're, we're mostly Metabo HPT and DeWalt. We don't really want a third battery platform that we have to manage on our site. So those are the two brands that we use mostly. How far off the house will you span using two by 12? That's a sticky question and I'm not gonna give you an answer. First of all, if you don't know your lumber spans, then hire a structural engineer to help you figure out what those are. He's gonna ask you some things. What's your tributary load? How far is the actual span? Are you, do you have a cantilever past the beam? How far on center are your joists? All those things factor in to how far a joist can span. I'm not qualified 
and I'm not being paid to give out that kind of information for liability reasons alone, I will not ever answer a structural question on any of my social media pages or on YouTube. Uh, I just feel it's safer if you hire a professional to do that. If you can't afford that or you don't wanna pay somebody, then I'm sorry, you're gonna have to go somewhere else to find that information. Ever put Inlight products on or in a retaining wall? We don't do too many retaining walls. I have put them in some privacy screens and some vertical application walls and just kind of put them in randomly and I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so that's where we've used their their product in a vertical application. I haven't had much experience with retaining walls. I've done a few here and there, but I haven't done any recently. It's not really our jam. All right, guys, there you go. I hope that answers some questions for you. If you got something out of this video, don't forget to click that subscribe button, hit the bell icon to be notified when we're putting out new content, and don't forget to like this video, share it around, and leave a comment below, and I'll get back to you in a timely fashion. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.